Hello, hello, and welcome to Inner Work for Greater Good, where I teach you change makers, uh, anyone, if you are passionate about making a difference in the world, I teach you inner work that accelerates your power to change the world. My name is Emily Eldridge. I am the founder and CEO of Change Light. Uh, I have an online community where change makers gather, people who are trying to make a difference in the world, mission driven leaders, etc., where they gather to learn this inner work and learn the techniques and learn the discoveries and really work on themselves so that they can be happier and healthier and more whole and at peace, and then bring that to their work in the world outside. As I see it, our world's ills and humanity's ills are because we are sick, we are ill, we have traumas, we have wounds, we have triggers and defense mechanisms that cause us to show up in ways that aren't entirely healthy. I mean, let's get real. Uh, you know, right now, as I'm speaking, uh, recently, there's the whole Ukraine, Russia situation going on. And we see all these other conflicts, we see these problems, problems in the world. And, uh, you know, I, I would argue that a lot of that is because we are not healthy on the inside. The people who are making the decisions, the people who are causing the conflicts um, and others, you know, we all in different ways have things that we need to heal and that we need to heal as a whole, as humanity. And so that's why my mission is all about accelerating the healing of humanity in our planet through teaching change makers, mission driven leaders, impact drivers to teach us to teach you all inner work that accelerates your ability to do that and to do that with happiness and joy and peace and greater effortlessness, you know, because I think a lot of times we make it too hard. I mean, it is hard work what we do, but at the same time, we don't have to be so stressed and miserable doing it. So that being said, in today's conversation and today's show, I want to episode, I want to talk about the top three struggles of people who are trying to make a difference in the world, who are trying to change the world, change makers, who are mission-driven leaders, those of us who feel called to make a difference in some way or another. And we're all called in different ways. And we are also called, you know, we might feel called, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, called by something outside of us or called by something internally. A lot of times I, what I talk about though is that internal drive, which is your truth to guide you to really make that difference. But however you feel called and whatever you feel called to do, you are what I would call a change maker. And the reality is those of us who are really passionate about making a difference, we have our struggles. I can't even tell you how many people I've met who if you saw them on the outside, you'd be like, wow, they're so smart. They're so put together. They're so successful they're running this organization everybody thinks they're these fabulous people etc and yet on the inside they're not they're a mess they're unhappy they have so many insecurities and wounds and, and, it, and it manifests in terms of their personal relationships or in terms of how they lead their people or try to lead their people um, or, or in terms of sometimes their private habits that they engage in that are not healthy uh, because they don't know how to deal with these inner struggles. They're so focused on trying to make a difference. They don't know how to deal with this. And so that's why it's really, really important that we focus on what are those inner struggles? Well, there are three typical inner struggles that I see among people, and I include myself, those of us who really are passionate about making a difference in the world and trying to make a difference in the world. The first one I'm going to call not enoughness. The second one is not receiving help. And the third one is lack of self-care and even just self-consideration. So in terms of not enough, enoughness, the first one, we're going to actually divide that into two types of not enoughness. And as I share these struggles, see if you can identify with these and see if you see them in other people you know who are also trying to make a difference in the world. When it comes to not enoughness, there's this not, sense of not enoughness that you're never doing enough. You're never accomplishing everything that you think you need to accomplish. You're never quite reaching the goals, the bigger visions that you might have, that you're like, I'm here to have this impact. It's like it's always out there in this vision or this, this 
this is the big impact I really want to have. And it feels like you're never doing enough to get there. So that's on a sort of bigger scale personally, is that not enoughness. Like I'm not getting there yet. I feel like I'm spinning my wheels or I feel like no matter what I do, I still don't get there. But there's even on a daily basis, the not enoughness. Always this sense of I'm not doing enough. I'm not making enough of a difference. There are so many problems in the world and I can just never seem to you know, figure it all out or help everybody that I wanna help. I always feel like I'm falling short. I always feel like there's always more to do and I can never do it. So there's that sense of not enoughness. You're never doing enough. It's like, even no matter how hard you work, no matter how much of a workaholic you might be, no matter how many systems you have in place, et cetera, it still feels like you're not doing enough because there's always some fire you got to put out, or there's always some trauma happening in the world. There's always some disaster, or there's always, you know, people's like, people are always falling apart around you, let's say. So I just want to honor that. So that's one, that's the first of the top three struggles that I've seen, that's a big one, is that sense of I'm never doing enough. And I think a lot of that comes from the fact that as change makers and those of us who are called to make a difference, we have this drive. We may not even know where it's coming from, but it's just this drive. I have to make this difference. And so what I think can happen is that the drive, you know, that, that's, that, that, that impulse, that, that need, that, um, you know, just passion, that focus of like, here's what I need to do. And here's the impact I need to have. And here's the change that I want to affect in the world can also kind of come against up against the reality that, you know, we also have human needs, you know, I mean, we also have, uh, we need to sleep. Uh, we need to eat, you know, we can't always be on a constant treadmill of doing, doing, doing. Um, and so what happens is too, is that we just feel like we've, we're never, we've, we're never quite getting there. Um, and also that that drive can be so powerful that it's not really taking into consideration the fact that we're human, if that makes sense, you know, where it's just like, I just know I have to do this thing. And so it's almost like it's never satisfied that drive because you always feel like there's more you can do. There's more, there, there are always people you need to help and there's more you need to do to create all these changes or affect all of this impact and everything in the world. That's the doing not enoughness. The other, the other half of the number of the first not enoughness is being. That a lot of change makers feel like they internally, they are not enough. They're not strong enough. They're not smart enough. They're not working hard enough. They're not uh, educated enough. They're not you know, a good enough person, they are not funded enough, they are, or, or they're, they're not, um, they're not worthy, is a lot of times what's going on there, is that feeling that I am not good enough to affect this change, or I am, you know, I don't know that I can actually do this, I don't know that I'm worthy of this, I don't know that I have all, everything that it will take for me to make this happen. I wanna share this quote. Let me just find the quote real quick from, um, oh, where is it? This quote, for, oh, there it is. Um, this quote from Mother Teresa, where she says, you know, of course the famous Mother Teresa, who was such an amazing humanitarian and had such an impact on people all over the world. Her focus was on orphans and, and sick people in India. And she had, you know, um, centers there and then they, they grew all over the world. And I'll just give you a little background on her. I've read a couple of books about her. From what I recall, and you might be able to correct me on this, but she first, she was a nun and she got her first calling at the age of 19, I believe. And she saw it as Jesus had called her, you know, she'd been called to do this, what she ended up doing in the world. And, and she was, she was incredible at what she accomplished. Um, and she had such a huge impact, but at the same time, I love this quote that she says, she said, I know God won't give me anything I can't handle. I just wish he didn't trust me so much. And what I love about that is it kind of speaks to that sense of, in a way, the, the doing and the being. It's kind of the, you know, I, you know, I, okay, so I know that God's giving me as much as I can handle and never will give me more, but 
I don't even know if I can do it. Like, I wish he didn't trust me so much. I don't even know if I can handle all of this. I don't know if I can really do what I feel, what I'm feeling called to do. And also I will say this too, something that's not very well known about Mother Teresa is she was in a dark night of the soul for about 50 years. And if you're not familiar with what the dark night of the soul is, it's basically, and I've been through one and you may have been through one as well, or multiple. I've been through, I call it like I've been through a dark night of the soul. And then I've had like my mini dark nights of the soul. But basically uh, mine was back in 2009 and I've talked about it on this show before. Um, But the dark night of the soul really where it's like you completely lose all faith. You feel disconnected spiritually, emotionally, just Uh, It feels like you're just in this darkness and there's no light and there's no way out and there's no future and there's no purpose or sense of meaning. Believe it or not, Mother Teresa was in a dark night of the soul for about 50 years, for decades. And this is shown by her journals, her letters, uh, you know, her journal writings, her letters to um, priests and uh, bishops and cardinals and others, and she, when, which she shared that, in which she felt, and this is the way she saw it, is she felt that uh, Jesus had abandoned her, like she originally had this, this, you know, luminous um, calling to do what she ended up doing, but that over time that went away. She stopped feeling that. And so she felt very forsaken. She felt abandoned. And she really, really struggled with that. I have to say, that's one of the things that I'm kind of blown away by her, aside from everything that she accomplished, is the fact that she could still keep accomplishing those things, even as she felt so empty inside, that she still was that light for other people. Everybody talked about how she would just radiate this joy. So somehow she was able to radiate this presence while at the same time feeling really empty and dark and and sad inside. And so one of the things she really struggled with was her worthiness, her sense of value, her sense of, you know, she felt abandoned. She felt that maybe she hadn't done enough or she wasn't enough. And so that's a really extreme example of what I would say about the not enoughness of the being. But, you know, you may think about the things that you feel called to do and consider whether you feel like you actually have all of the power you need to do those things, to, to, to be that presence in the world. I've also shared on the show before that I deeply struggled with that in the past, where I didn't feel like I was capable of actually doing the things that I know that I'm called to do. And my calling just is so big. And so I was always really like, it's, it's like imposter syndrome. You may have heard of that before, where oftentimes imposter syndrome gets tr- <clears throat> triggered when you're given, let's say, a position, um, let's say, you know, you're in an organization and you are, you know, are given a particular role, you're promoted to a particular role or you're, you know, nominated or you, you assume a p- particular leadership position, that a lot of times what happens is it can trigger that imposter syndrome. Because while some parts of us may feel worthy of being in that position and worthy of Um, having that much power, if you will. There are other parts of us that don't. A lot of times, and I've talked about the woundeds, a lot of times that's because of those inner woundeds that feel like that, that they are not big enough or, you know, powerful enough to do this. It can also be because of the controllers, those inner critics that tell us that we're not good enough or undermine our faith in ourselves. And so what ha- the problem, though, is that you end up as a change maker, you can be in a position where you're really there to make a difference. Or, I mean, it can even get triggered by like, let's say you're not accustomed to speaking on stage very often. and You're asked to speak on stage about something that you're like, I know I can talk about this, but I don't know. I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know if I'm smart enough. I don't know if I'm pretty enough. I don't know if blah, 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 blah. You know, all these insecurities get triggered. So it's that sense of not being enough can be one of the really, really big as part of that not enoughness, number one, uh, really, really big issues with change makers, with those of us who are called to make a difference in the world, those of us who are trying to make that difference. So not enoughness is a big one. Be aware of how that shows up for you in terms of how you feel and know that you are not alone. I, 
you know, I, I, I still struggle with it. I'll probably struggle. I'll probably have issues with this, you know, for, for most of my life, because as you step into higher levels in your work or your visibility or what have you, it triggers these feelings of not enoughness. Maybe you're not doing enough. You're not enough for that position, or you just don't have what it takes. Just know that this is part of the process. But at the same time, I would argue that you can also heal those parts, as I always talk about. Those are a lot of times it's those X powers that are keeping us feeling small and not good enough. And so we can actually work, heal those. And, and I talk about this a lot, of course, the drawing out process, healing those parts so that you don't struggle with that sense of not being enough, but also of not doing enough. Because that's what also those inner controllers can do as well, is they can criticize us and make us feel like we're never doing enough, or they can push us and push us and push us relentlessly and make us feel like no matter what we do, we're never good enough, we're never doing enough. So that's how the woundeds and controllers play into these struggles as change makers. So that's the first one, not enoughness, the not enoughness in what you're doing and not enoughness in who you are in your being. Number two, not receiving help, difficulty receiving help and support. There are a lot of reasons why us change makers and us, us mission driven people, those of us who are really passionate about making a difference, there are lots of reasons why we struggle with, with, with receiving. Uh, for one thing, a lot of times, like if, we, if you feel like you've got this, you know, this is what I'm here to do, or this is my vision, this is my mission, is we can tend to sometimes think, well, I'm the only one who can do this, or other people won't get it, so I just have to do it myself. Um, or we can also come from situations in our past where we didn't, we didn't, we weren't supported, like maybe in our family units, we really actually didn't receive the support we needed. And so we can tend to view like everything unconsciously a lot of times from that perspective of thinking, well, no one's going to help me with this. So I just have to do it myself. I will just throw in here a little bit about the American culture. I don't know about other cultures as well as I know about the American culture, but we are steeped in that, that sense that we have to be strong. We have to do everything ourselves. And what that can often do though is cut us off from that willingness and even that vulnerability that's required to receive. That's something else I want to add to. I, I, there was this wonderful quote. I wish I had it in front of me, but I remember seeing this like post on Facebook and it was by this woman who talked about that the whole attitude of like, I have to do this myself and not receiving help. And, and, um, yeah, just hyper independence, I think is what she called it, that that's actually a trauma reaction that when we're so hyper independent and I can do it all myself and I don't need your help. And again, this, this, you may not be conscious that you are actually doing this or have this attitude. It can be an unconscious thing. So it's good to just kind of tune in and notice when is someone offering help and you're not receiving it when you really could receive it. And it could be very helpful to you. But the point is that that hyper independence can cause us to, it can be rooted in trauma can be rooted in the trauma of, again, if you felt like you were abandoned when you were a kid or you were very alone or you were left to fend for yourself or you felt like nobody really listened to you or honored how you felt and nobody really showed up for you or supported you when you needed them, is that that hyper independence can come from that as well. So again, that's <clears throat> speaking to the whole uh, change maker thing of not receiving help because maybe on some subconscious level, we don't think that we're actually gonna get it. And I wanna throw that in there as well. A lot of change makers I know, um, usually a lot of times what is fueling them is their own trauma. It's because they've experienced something awful happen in their lives. And so they wanna make it better for others. And so it's all this focus on, I've got to try to change this for other people and, and, and are driven by like, okay, I'm doing this thing for them. So that's a one way street, isn't it? It's like, I'm helping them, but they don't allow it to come back. They don't allow the two way street. And here's another reason why people often don't do allow the two way street. And I have done this before myself, the fear of disappointment. We're afraid if we do open up and we are vulnerable enough to allow other people to help us, that we will be disappointed that those people won't do what we want them to do, or they won't do it as well as we want them to do it, or they won't show up the way, you know, whatever. 
And again, that can often be because of, of our trauma, our wounds, because we have been disappointed before. And disappointment, it's funny because I feel like the word itself just sounds kind of like not like to me it doesn't sound like a very emotional word you know disappoint oh i'm disappointed like it sounds sort of you know kind of not that intense kind of oh honey <laughs> disappointment is a big one because the, and it's what keeps a lot of us stuck or a lot of us in that place of hyper independence or a lot of us you know, just trying, yeah, just trying to do things ourselves because we're afraid or not, or not connecting with other people or not opening ourselves to relationships, et cetera, because we're terrified of being disappointed. And the reality is we can't control what other people do. We can only control what we do. And so it's even also an issue of control. If you're constantly trying to avoid disappointment, it's like you're trying to avoid that feeling, of course, because it's painful, but you're also trying to control the situation so that you're trying to keep things under your control so that you don't risk having to open up risk being disappointed, risk having other people not showing up for you. But of course, as we know, when you keep that from happening, what actually ends up happening is you end up feeling very alone and not receiving the help that you need. Think about the vision that you have. I, I, I interviewed this wonderful change maker um, and she's the, the, I do inspiring interviews of change makers in my community and the change like community. And so she's for this month of March and um, she's an amazing psychologist in Morocco and she does um, creates mental health tools and trainings and apps for teachers and young people. Um, she does amazing work, but the point is she, she made a really good, good comment. She goes, you know, I used to think that I had to do everything by myself. Um, I had to do it all alone because I was the one with the vision, et cetera. And then she said, she kind of sat down with herself and she goes, you know what? That's not rational. And I love that she put it that way. She's like, I realized that is, that's actually not rational. Cause she's like, I think about the things that I want to create. And, and then I look at it and I go, wait, and, and I alone, I'm supposed to do all those things like by myself with no help. And so that's what helped her shift out of this, of the, some of the hyper independence of some of the thinking she had to, you know, do it all herself. I'm going to throw in here another term, savior complex. I'm not saying she had the savior complex, but we can also have a savior complex. We want to be the hero. And if we allow other people to help us, or we allow other people to be part of our vision or what we're doing, then we're not going to be the hero as much. So that can be another thing too. So the point is that this whole thing of not receiving help. There are a lot of reasons why we don't do that. A lot of that is subconscious. I will also throw in here that the X power that's most associated I found with hyper-independence is the defender. Defenders tend to be the ones that build the walls. You know, they're the ones who tend to want you to feel strong, you know, and, and independent and do your own thing more than the other two for the, for the most part. I mean, the, 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 yeah, the, the free spirit can sometimes be like that. But the point is that your defender can be that part of you that is trying, that is preventing you in, in its desire to protect you from disappointment. It can also be actually preventing you from connection and from the vulnerability required to actually open up and receive other people's help and support in achieving your mission. And here's the other thing too, that it took me forever to realize you may be a change maker and you're here to make a difference and you have a vision and I'll, okay, I'm gonna put this way. I am this, per, I am, I was like this for many years and I just assumed everybody else was like that too. I just assumed everybody else wanted to do their own thing and they had their own visions and missions and they were trying to accomplish. And I never, it never occurred to me that, no, actually some people just like to support others with the vision and the mission. And it took my mother saying it at one point, just sort of matter of factly one day, she goes, well, you know, there are people who actually just, they don't need to have their own thing. They actually just, they actually like to support people like you. And I was like, Whoa. I mean, it was like my head spun around like Beetlejuice. I'm like, what? Really? Uh, wow. Okay. So I just want to say too, that when we allow others to help us, when we receive their help, we're actually giving them joy. I've, I've received help. I resisted receiving all kinds of help throughout my life. And, but when, until finally I realized that, you know what, first of all, I was denying a gift that they wanted to give me and that it was bringing them joy to give that to me. 
that by denying that gift, whatever, in what, whatever form it, it took, I was actually denying them the joy of giving it. And then I thought about the joy that I get from giving to others and helping others in different ways. And imagine if someone said no to me and I'm like, but I want to, but I, I really like, well, no, no, because they didn't feel they deserved it or what have you. So that's why it's also really important to work on ourselves as change makers, as people trying to make a difference and recognize where maybe we're not receiving the help that is coming to us. And also recognize the ego issues, the X powers that are inside of us, those inner blocks, wounds, triggers, you know, blind spots, defense mechanisms, struggles, limiting beliefs, et cetera, that are inside of us that are preventing us from really allowing others to support us in because, because it feels good for us and because it actually feels good for them as well, believe it or not. So the final one is lack of self-care. So, oh, and I just want to throw in here, by the way, number two was, number one, of course, was not, not enoughness doing and being. And number two is uh, not receiving help. Well, think of how those also relate. If you feel like you're never doing enough or getting enough done, imagine how it would change if you actually allowed yourself to receive help in doing it you could actually change the world a lot faster. Just want to throw that out there. Okay, so finally not receiving, I'm, I'm sorry, a lack of self-care. As change makers, and I think I might've talked about this before, we can be so, we tend to be so outwardly focused. We see the world in terms of what do we need to fix? How can we fix this? What do we need to do? You know, what are the problems we need to solve? And so we can tend to be very, or, you know, how are the, who are the people we can help and how can I help this person? Do we tend to be very outwardly focused? Remember before I was talking about that one way street, we're just like, well, I'm helping you. But I find that a lot of change makers don't, not nearly enough, unless they're already in some kind of maybe mental health or coaching or some kind of space like this, like I'm, like I'm in, rarely do enough introspection rarely do enough tuning in and noticing how they're feeling. And not only that, valuing how they're feeling as well. Because those of us who are trying to change the world can tend to, uh, you know, basically like convince ourselves that no, 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 like how I feel doesn't matter because there are starving kids here or there's a war-torn area here or what have you. We are very, I, I will say for myself, and this may apply to you as well, very good at dismissing our own feelings. I'm very, I used to be very, very good at dismissing my own feelings and diminishing how I felt because I didn't feel like I deserved to feel that way because I thought, well, I, there, there are so many other people in the world who were struggling and suffering. Um, and all, but also because I really felt like I wasn't helping anybody. Like I was so driven to help people that I felt like I wasn't helping anybody if I was actually focusing on myself and helping myself and working on myself and healing myself. That was back during that dark night of the soul when I, you know, was, I just felt so unworthy in general, but then I also felt so like I did that, that I didn't deserve to work on myself because other people needed my help. And I just wanted to focus on them until finally it just hit me this one day I had this, it was like a voice in my head that said, I may have shared this in the show before. What if by healing yourself, you're healing others? And what if by healing yourself, you're healing the world? What if by actually, I would say, in, in, in my words today, I would say, what if doing your inner work enables you to do even greater, greater good in the world? And so it's that, that a lot of times as change makers and mission-driven people, we're so focused on our mission and our objectives and our goals that we rarely turn inwards and do the self-care that's necessary. Do the introspection, do the, do the inner work and do the self-care. And I'm going to argue that a lot of times that self-care, when we think of self-care, we think in terms of like, well, I just need to like, uh, you know, I'm going to get my nails done. Uh, I'm going to get a massage. And that's fantastic because that can really bring a lot, a lot of peace, relaxation that's good for the body to relieve the tension. Um, but self-care is so much more than just like, you know, a physical, act, a physical, attending to your physical body. It really is about, you know, whether it's meditation or whether it's doing the drawing out as I often teach and, you know, that I teach in my work and really noticing those parts of you that need your attention that need to be honored, 
whether it's pain you're feeling, uh, you know, wounds that you've got, or even defense mechanisms that are trying to get a message to you. Because maybe you keep manifesting, things keep happening, the same patterns keep happening over and over again, because you're really not stopping long enough to really tune in. And here's the cool thing, obviously, is that when you actually do that inner work and you feel more whole and at peace on the inside, it's a whole lot easier to make a difference in the world. You're clearer, you're stronger, you're wiser, you're more courageous. So that inner work, when you actually do that and you pay attention to yourself and you honor who you are and how you feel and whatever your truth is guiding you to do rather than what you think you should do, but is guiding you to do, that's when you can really make the biggest difference in the world. So that those three struggles, not enoughness, not receiving help, excuse me, and lack of self-care. I hope this has been helpful for you. And I really do hope that you'll sit and, excuse me, I'm burping all of a sudden. <laughs> I really do hope that you will sit with these three and just notice how these show up for you. And, you know, maybe you've mastered one, but you're still working on another. But also look at some of the deeper, I always argue, look at some of the deeper emotional subconscious things that are happening inside of you that are causing you to have these struggles. As I mentioned, wounded, um, um, controllers, defenders, you may have these parts that are actually causing you to re refuse help from other people or not recognize it sometimes when it shows up um, that are causing you to think that you're never doing enough um, or to feel like um, you aren't enough, that you don't, that you, you know, aren't talented enough or whatever it is to actually do what you're here to do. That's why I always say you have all of the power you need to be everything you're here to be. It doesn't mean you're here to do it all by yourself, but whatever presence you're here to be in the world, you've already got that inside of you. And so you are enough. You are enough just as you are. And the way you can truly come to know that, though, is by honoring these parts that may be making you feel like you're not enough or causing you to not receive the help that is here for you, the help and the support. And then, of course, finally, you know, really knowing that you are worthy of caring for, know that you are worthy of being taken care of, you are worthy of, of the time and attention, other people's time and attention to really, and, and your own time and attention, to really focus inward and really honor the truth of who you are and how you feel and what you need, what you need emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually to continue your work in the world in the highest way possible. I hope this has been helpful. Thank you so much. Again, I'm Emily Eldridge with Change Light, the Change Light community. You're always welcome to join us in there. I do all kinds of fun things. You've got, I've got the course I teach you, all the good stuff, the inner work for greater good, as well as doing interviews. And I've got weekly Q&A sessions and good stuff like that. So I hope you'll join us in there. Uh, uh, just go to changelight.world. That's how you'll get there. www.changelight.world. All right. Thank you so much. And you have a wonderful week. I'll see you next week. Bye.